So going to cover some of these things here. I'm just going to briefly go over the topics we'll go over today in this presentation. So some key points about fine art printing, uh, color managed workflow environment, choosing a printer, choosing print media, prepping your image for print, making the print, after the print, the printer maintenance, printer troubleshooting, and then some questions. If you have questions throughout the presentation, feel free to ask them. If it's really relevant to what we're talking about at the time, I uh, will do my best to answer them. If it's something that is not directly related to what we're talking about, then I will um, put it off until the end just so that the continuity, people don't get confused with switching topics. Okay, so for some key points to fine art printing. Um, first one is a fine art print begins at image capture. Image imperfections are hidden at social media resolutions. In print, these imperfections can be very obvious. So technique in the beginning, it's all important from beginning to end. Capture to output, that's where the fine art print starts. Creating consistently high quality fine art prints is all about trying to achieve the extra percent. So this is a process that requires discipline, methodical approach, and attention to detail. The journey to creating fine art prints will cost time and money, consumables, and perhaps equipment. So making notes of your mistakes and success will help you, significantly help you. Um, this is an important one. Become very familiar with papers and canvases that you'll use more frequently. Initially, experimenting with too many at once can hinder your learning curve. It's kind of uh, one of those things where it's important to get to really know what that paper and the canvas, that substrate can deliver. Um, before you start playing around with a lot of other variables. A fine art print, also known as a G-Clay, is a very high quality print that uses archival quality pigment inks and acid-free fine art substrates. Uh, these substrates often have a high quality feel to them. They won't feel really cheap and plasticky. They'll, they'll have some substance and the tactile um, qualities of them will be very high quality. Um, so for a G-Clay, a lot of people have heard that term over the years. There's no real difference anymore um, between G clay and a fine art print. Um, you shouldn't be paying more for G clay print. It's just a term that basically is um, for printing with inkjet printers and technology. So as long as the fine art print it has the qualities that's described here, then it's a high quality print that you'll be happy with. So for a color managed workflow environment, I won't go into too much detail about some of this stuff because um, there are you know plenty of other resources for dedicated to this. There's been a lot of other previous X-Rite webinars and instructors have gone through this thoroughly. So for today, there's not enough real time to go through all this in depth. So basically, you want to calibrate your profile, calibrate your profile, your monitor to a proper brightness for your environment. As we'll see a bit later, some of the issues can arise with prints being too dark, for example. If your monitor is too bright, you want to have a daylight balanced uh, lighting environment, roughly 5500 to 6500 K um, or D65. You might have seen that term. Color managed workflow is also required for black and white prints. We're dealing with tonality here when we're printing. It's not specifically red, green, or blue, or it's it's tonals, tonal values. So we want uh, even for black and white prints, we want color managed workflow. Anti-glare monitors, definitely preferred. They will not, um, well, it's in the name, but they won't, the glare from a glossy screen can be distracting and actually cause issues with um, various processing um, methods. So use an X-Rite monitor printer calibration device. Don't visually calibrate. Years ago, Adobe and all these, some other companies had processes where you could look at your monitor and adjust everything, brightness, contrast, manually the color it doesn't it's not nearly as effective as using an actual hardware calibrator so whether you're doing it for your printer or your monitor depending on how you know how involved you're going to get with um, your printing then you should use um, an x-rite um, device to do that properly for you use a controlled repeatable environment so for example lighting if you can control the lighting in your environment so that it's not changing 
sun coming through a window constantly or changing through the day, that kind of a thing, if uh, it'll help with creating that final product. Be aware of surrounding surface colors. So this includes clothes that you're wearing. If you're wearing like fluorescent clothes, really bright clothes, or desks, if they're really bright colored desks, all that stuff can impact your visual perception of the color. So you want to try and keep things as neutral as, as possible. So let's move into choosing a printer. So choosing a printer, this uh, basically is pivotal to your fine art print. So uh, a lot of people will look at a printer that's cheaper and, and think that it's you know, better value. Uh, there are issues though with using cheaper consumer printers. For example, the biggest is they actually will cost you more on ink um, in a very short time. So the larger printers have bigger ink cartridges and therefore the per milliliter um, cost of that ink is significantly cheaper. Also, because of the, um, the resolution is required to print on the cheaper printers, it's higher because it's not as um, fine, the printing head and the tolerances. So you want to determine your largest required print size. So for example, if you will never print larger than 13 by 19, you could use you know, a 17 inch um, wide printer, for example. I recommend that you buy a printer that's perhaps one size larger than you will normally print because of the fact that it's better to leave some white space around the printed image on your papers for handling reasons and, and framing reasons. So consider that. The level of manufacturing tolerances, the better the printer you get, the print heads and the quality of the hardware will be have a tighter tolerance. So they'll be more repeatable, more consistent, uh, results won't fluctuate from um, different settings and such. Roll paper capability. This really is an issue or a uh, um, decision to be made for desktop printers. So roughly like the 17 inch wide printers. Some of them will have the ability to take roll paper and some won't. There's pros and cons to uh, both, which I'll get into in a second, but pretty much any printer, it's 24 inches or wider, will have uh, built-in roll support right, right out of, off the bat. The ability to be networked, this could be important if you're going to be having more than one printer, for example, or you can't have your printer right beside you on your desk due to size. If you get a printer that can be networked, then you can have it anywhere in your studio. Self-calibrating and profiling. Some printers have a spectrophotometer built into the printer that will allow it to pr make printer profiles for you automatically. So that's kind of convenient. There are advantages to doing it yourself though. And uh, we can go over some of that later. So the type of inks it uses. So there's basically dye or pigment for inkjet uh, printers and you pretty much want to go pigment. There's not that many dye printers anymore for, for consumer um, fine art printing. Uh, the dyes, um, they used to have a deeper black, but the pigments have caught up with that and they, the pigment lasts a lot longer in terms of print permanence and the archival characteristics. Uh, this is an important one if you are someone who chooses to print matte and photo and glossy blacks prints. Um, some printers have the ability to have the matte black and the photo black simultaneously installed and then you can actually make a matte print and then a glossy print back to back without having to change those inks. So it um, takes some money and time when you have a printer that you have to switch the matte and black inks with. The printer profiles and media choices available. The more popular printers will have printer profiles and uh, available from more of the uh, manufacturers, the fine art printing manufacturers. So that's a good um, option if you don't plan on making your own printer profiles initially. So that's something to consider when you're purchasing your printer. Choosing print media. So for the print media, the fine art paper substrate is basically going to be acid-free or lignin-free. 
that um, will allow it not to degrade, not to yellow, not to um, for, you know keep color and, and contrast and the punch. So that is something you definitely want to look for is you want an acid-free, lignin-free um, paper. There is bright white and natural offerings for papers and canvases. So basically a bright white is noticeably brighter white than a natural colored um, paper. So a natural colored paper would be have a cream or an off-white or an ivory kind of look to it. And those are technically more print permanent than, than the um, bright white kind of papers. You'll see terms like GSM and mil. So GSM is the weight of the paper, so grams per square meter, and the mil is the thickness. And basically, you, they're not, they're not correlate to each other in the sense that a, a heavier paper is always thicker, or a thicker paper is always heavier. It totally depends on what they've made the paper or the canvas with. So that is going to determine. So, but a GSM, for example, a 100 GSM paper compared to 300 GSM paper, that 300 GSM paper is going to feel a lot more substantial, and it's going to have more of a you know a feel like a tactile um, pleasantry to it. Substrate types. The substrate is basically what the coating for the inkjet coating is put onto. So typically it's paper or canvas there's aluminum now and you can basically there's a lot of um, substrates you can use and there's you can coat your own it's, that gets into a whole other uh, realm but it's it's pretty exciting that there's a lot of options available surface types so most uh, the biggest the main categories would be matte luster glossy and then you have smooth and textured so um, typically with um, the matte papers, you'll have a lot more options for um, the having the, the textured kind of um, surfaces. OBAs. This, these are what give the papers or the canvases the bright white aspect. And basically, um, the optical brightening agents are um, basically um, a process that they use that reacts to UV light. So the UV light hits the optical brightening agents and it makes you know colors pop more, a bit contrastier. And so this also can degrade the print permanence of a print using the OBAs, but either way, I mean, any fine art print with the proper inks and paper will last long, long, long time, at least, at least 60 to 70 years with the current uh, printers and, and papers and inks. So third-party media, there's a lot, other than just the uh, manufacturer's papers, there's Hanamul, Canson, Infinity, Moab, Ilford, Breathing Color, Legion, Innova, Red River Paper, and Harman. There's, there's a lot, and they all provide really high-quality um, offerings and paper canvas, and some offer aluminum as well. But basically, play around with... Um, some of them get the sample packs are a good way to help choose but like I was mentioned earlier pick something that you're going to stick with um, first and get really used to how that paper or canvas provides um, for you cut sheet versus roll so basically you can on any and any printer that takes a roll you can also use a cut sheet so cut sheet is basically you know eight and a half by 11 17 by 22 those kind of sizes there are, there's not a cost difference between them. It's more of a convenience thing. Just because a roll of paper doesn't necessarily cost more um, or it isn't cheaper than cut sheet, box of cut sheet paper. So the roll paper allows you to lay out um, prints, more prints or different sizes prints. The cut sheet is a bit more restrictive as to what, you know, how, how many prints, this, you know, size of the print and all that kind of a thing. So that's something to keep in mind, but um, they're you know, all in all the quality, the offerings are available in both cut sheet and roll. So most of the high quality papers will have both of those options for you. So this point is is important in the sense that it's about art. I mean, there's a lot of technical stuff behind this, and it's good to know the technical stuff, but you basically want to let 
the image choose the media to some degree. So if you have, for example, a really soft image, uh, maybe that's better on a matte paper that doesn't have as much punch as a glossy paper might. And if you have a really intense, vivid image that you want to print, then maybe you print that on a luster or glossy surface coated paper. So there's something to think about there. So that's why when you're playing around with some papers, it's good to have one of at least one of each. So like a matte and a gloss and a luster so that you can get aware, become um, you know, aware of how the print will um, reflect onto the, the media. Okay, so um, after this slide, I'm going to go into Lightroom and show some of these things. And then um, we'll talk about making actual print. And then I'll also go into Lightroom and show you that process. I'm just using Lightroom today. It's, it's, it's quicker, easier for demonstration. Um, and um, so I think a lot of people are, are at this point using Lightroom. So it's, that's good. Uh, inspect image at 100% and use your keyboard for navigating around the image. So as we'll show you in a second, um, if you just take your mouse and scroll around the screen trying to look for imperfections, there's a chance that you're going to miss something. And so using your keyboard keys to page up and page down and go across your image, navigate that way will allow you to have a lot better success. This is the kind of stuff here, preparing your image, that it's critical that you nail some of these things and, and, and remove some of these blemishes or imperfections that your print may have because this stuff will be very obvious when you print big. And if you're printing, you know, 30, 40, 50, 60 inch prints, uh, you want to make sure at that time cost that uh, you, and materials, you don't want to make that mistake. The perception of color can change with print size. So, you know, if you have a, an eight and a half by 11 print with a lot of yellow in it, and then you print that same image at 40 inches with a lot of yellow at it, it will change. Your perception will change um, with that print. So keep that in mind as you're editing and making sure that white balance, everything is as good as you can make it because it's a lot different when, you know, you're just, just promoting marketing stuff on social media where it's not as critical. How much resolution? This is this is a big one. A lot of there's a lot of um, sometimes heated debates over this, but basically, when in the beginning stages, just print your image at if you have between 180 pixels per inch to as much as you have your camera native resolution, just print with it because I mean you can make lovely huge prints. I've made you know I've made 50, 60 inch prints on canvas using 180 pixels per inch and it's they're beautiful so just just print and know that you need at least 180 pixels per inch to you know get into that realm of um, you know quality print that 300 300 pixels per inch thing is really not um, so much for an inkjet it came it was back in the day where um, they were doing newsprint and stuff like that so basically if at least 180 pixels per inch and then you should get uh, pretty Good quality print and also as a print gets larger you're standing further back so therefore you're not going to notice as much if there is a detail decrease or that kind of thing so just um, don't obsess over the resolution just start printing and you'll see that you're gonna get results that you'll be happy with cropping and for aesthetic and editing accuracy as we'll see cropping is obviously for you know changing the aspect ratio of your cam of the, the image but it's also very important for editing accuracy in the early stages when you're changing your tonal values because it will impact what you have showing there in your global adjustments stuff like white balance noise sharpening chromatic aberration spotting all this stuff will be um, key for a better quality print and then you'll move into local adjustments such as color tweaks dodging and burning Soft proofing is, what I'll show you is that basically it's an indication of roughly how your image is going to come out on the selected media that you're going to print on. When you've done all this stuff, basically it will designate this image you've just worked on as the master image. And then in Lightroom, for example, you could use virtual copies for any print variation. So 
once you have your master copy, then you can you know make a whole bunch of virtual copies for the different print sizes, um, different color conversions, different you know get creative with that kind of a thing. But as long as you have that master image, then it's easy to you know synchronize the settings in, in Lightroom if you've made uh, updates to the master file. Okay, so basically I'm just going to go back here. So I was going to switch into Lightroom right now. And I'll show you a couple things here with regards to, okay, so basically you have, uh, I've had, I have certain files here just, to, just so I can demonstrate various aspects. So white balance, most of us know or are familiar with, with white balance, but it's just, as I mentioned with the perception of color, it's really important just to make sure, you know, play around and get your white balance proper. This really can, it can really benefit you having um, a color checker, for example, from X-Rite to make sure that you have a good solid reference of where your white balance should be out in the field. And then you can, you know, tweak to how you think it should look maybe because technical is technical and we want to make sure we also don't let the creative aspect get you know, drowned out by the technical. So, so you have your white balance. That's fantastic. And then the next issue that rears its ugly head, if you are printing, is that chromatic aberration. And chromatic aberration is basically the inability of, um, like, the, where an, a focus point, the wavelengths don't focus the same, like red, green, and blue don't focus the exact same point. So you get some issues there. So basically, I just found an image here I took with the uh, bottom here. And the bottom, the tail, you can see there's a bit of green there. So basically, that's chromatic aberration. There's usually green or magenta fringing or sometimes uh, blue and yellow. So basically, to fix that, we'll just go into our um, lens correction. And then you can see here that in the lens correction there's profile and manual. So if your camera had a, a lens profile, camera profile, you can enable this here and it would fix the chromatic aberrations for you. You can always tweak it, but it's a good place to start. You can also go into the manual tab here and you can see here that there's um, sliders here for the defringe. So to get rid of the chromatic aberration or color fringing that you see here, we see it's green here. So I'm going to go down to the green hue here. So basically bring the amount up and you can see it's going away. And sometimes you'll need to tweak where the green hue splits. But be careful that you don't overdo it because if you just crank this to one side or the other, you can see now some pretty bad banding around here. So again, to see this kind of a, an effect and to see what you're actually doing properly, you're going to want to make sure it's at least one to one and two to one can't hurt um, for this type of thing. If you've uh, messed that up a little bit, you can just double click on it to bring it back. On, on this presentation, I'm not going to go into really how to use all the tools in Lightroom. Uh, I just want to specify, you know, spend more time just work concentrating on the actual printing process and, and prepping for that. So that's how you get rid of the chromatic aberration. Now we'll do spotting and sharpening. So the spotting is where we might clean up dust spots and, and things like that. So basically what we can do is instead of just using your mouse and just kind of like dragging around and, oh, yeah, I found that spot, I found that spot, I missed that spot. The best way to do this, and there's you can do this in, in Photoshop as well, is if you use the page up and down uh, buttons, then you can basically go up and down systematically. Right now I'm hitting page down. And you can see if there's any issues in your image. If I push shift in page down now, my screen moves over to the right one. So now I can push page up and I can go through and see if there's any, any issues. Nothing there. Page, shift in page 
down and I go down again and then oh so there's one there so say that's a little dust spot or something that I want to get rid of then I can just press Q or go into my um, spot removal here and just click and then it's gone and then I'll continue with my oh there's another one here so Q get rid of that Let's move that over here sometimes uh, you need to play around with that to get chosen so go up and there was another one there so this is the the best technique of doing this so that you're not just haphazardly trying to figure out where you left off or because especially when certain situations where the, the background can get kind of busy it's not that easy to see some of these um, issues that you're going to deal with noise oh sorry my apologies I'll go back here and I'll talk about the sharpening here so the sharpening is found in the detail panel here so basically with sharpening you want to view it at at least 100% again, so either one to one. And what you'll want to do is you want the goal here is to make sure that the sharpening looks proper on the screen. Just it's it's a nice crisp image because we're going to do output sharpening when we print, but previously years ago you would you would kind of compensate for the printing at this stage and um, now just make sure that it's it's decent sharpness so the key components here are the masking so basically the masking button here slider sorry allows you to determine which areas of the image you're going to sharpen so if I hold the alt key down or the option key in the Mac and I slide this across basically the white parts of the image are what I'm going to be sharpening so for example I don't want to sharpen the background so I'm going to slide this over to get to the point where it's just you know, the crisp icicles and the berries. So then at this point you can increase your amount of your sharpening and the radius. And you can play around with this. It's going to be determined based. Each image is going to have its own uh, requirements for sharpening, whether this image is supposed to be a dreamier image or if it's a really harsh, crisp, kind of aggressive image. So there's a couple of different reasons of sharpening different purposes. But you can basically... If you switch this little button here, the detail, you can turn it on and off. So you can see, I think you can see it probably on your screens there, that you can see if I turn it off, it gets a little softer, especially around this area here. If I turn the preview back on, you're going to see it sharper there. So that's how, that's, that's the workflow of how to get your sharpening you know, to be um, accurate there. Noise. It's important to get to know how much noise will actually show up on your print so for example this is at two to one so two to one 200 percent magnification so this a lot of this noise won't show up in the image but I'm just exaggerate this just to show you what happens so basically there's two kinds of noise there's color noise and luminance noise the color noise it's what's going to be most distracting you'll see uh, you know the red green blue blotches colors in here that's color noise so you can basically drag up your slider here until the point where you just see that going away so now we have essentially no color noise so now the luminance noise this is where you have to be careful more careful because this you can you know really soften your image if you make a mistake go too far so the key here is to reduce the noise just so it's barely there. So if you hold your Alt key on Mac, or sorry, on Windows, or your Option key on Mac, it'll turn the image temporarily to grayscale, black and white, so you, can, you won't be distracted by the color of the image to determine how much noise you have left or not. So, I mean, you can also then preview your detail panel again so that's before and that's after a lot less noise that's at 200 percent so this image will print really clean um, now 
Okay, so I'll do the crop and tonality here. So for the cropping, I mentioned before that it's important to crop initially so that you're not affecting parts of the image that aren't going to be there. So for example, to show a quick, quick example of this, if I go to crop this image here, for example, and you can notice that the histogram at the top right, that is a lot of different tonal values here. Well, if for some interesting crazy reason I wanted to crop off the image just to the or the grasshopper, half of the grasshopper, watch what happens to the histogram as I bring this down. You can see that the tonal values change drastically. So there's almost no highlights right now. So if I was to do an edit with this, and I affected tonal values, white point, black point, if I only really intended to do use this portion, then my edits aren't as accurate as I could have been uh, initially. So think about that um, when you're going to make your initial edits. Okay, so now, whoops. That's definitely not how you want to crop an image. Okay, so now for the tonality to it's important to set your white and black points properly. So let me go out of this here, go down to the basic tab. Not sure what's going on with my Lightroom there. Okay, so now we're at the basic tab. And if you don't see these, um, these sliders, I'm just gonna quickly show you that you, under the cal camera calibration, you probably are not using the current process for Lightroom. So you may have old images you're looking at that had a different process version. So just make sure if you, um, you know, upgrade to the, uh, choose, upgrade your images to the current process version if you're interested in that. Okay, so basically the white and black point are what's going to uh, distribute the tonal value of your image to the best way possible. So if you hold down the Alt key, or option on Mac and you bring the black slider down you can see then that it's you can see the areas where it's starting to clip so you can put this to taste sometimes it's nice to have a bit really solid black there and then I bring the white do the same thing with the white slider and bring it up until the point where you see a little bit of clipping now you can see from there that image is significantly got more punch and, and vibrance than the initial one there Okay, so now that I have proper black and white points set, you don't really need to worry about exposure or contrast so much. I really didn't need to touch that. So that's one thing to point out is that it's it's important to get your tonal value settled uh, properly. Okay, so now for local adjustments and creative sharpening, this is the, the local adjustments basically, and in, to go through this quickly, in Lightroom, you'd basically select your adjustment brush, and then you can, for example, if you wanted to make an area of this image really blue, then you could just paint in that area. So this is how you can um, finesse certain areas of your image uh, and not affect, them, not affect them globally. Okay, so now I'm going to show you soft proofing quickly. So soft proofing is basically a way to kind of get an indication of how you're going to, um, how you're going to what your print will look like when it's finished. So what we'll do is we'll push S to get into um, S for soft roofing down here you can see and click on that soft roofing box. And what's going to happen is basically when you have the soft proof, this is giving a bit of a bit of an issue here with this screen. Let me come out and come back. Okay, so now we'll see this here. There's a bit of an issue, I think, with uh, Lightroom my system of the webinar. Um, so basically what we'll do is this is now showing us if as if I was going to print this image onto, uh, for example, Hanamule um, Daguerre Canvas, for example. And you can see that the drop, the intensity drop to the image because it's a matte paper. If I use a glossier paper like a Brita, you can see the punch come right back. So that's the kind of thing you have to you'll play around with. And what I can do is I can create a proof copy of this. So now when I edit 
this to try and bring back the blacks or try and bring back the, the punch, I can then um, try and get it as close as possible. So you'll notice this little bit here, this little pink there, that is showing me that this area will be out of um, gamut. So when I print this on that paper, you're going to get, um, you know, these colors won't reproduce properly. So you can see if I'm just adjusting the saturation, it's getting worse. To get rid of that, I can just bring back the saturation a bit. And then, you know, then that print would print. Um, all the colors would be there, but you would lose some of the punch just because um, it's the, the surface of the paper is, is matte and not glossy. So that's soft proofing in a nutshell. There's perceptual and relative intense for now. Just use one. And it's uh, most of the images, you're not going to see much of a difference. Um, so don't uh, get too... Um, don't get too worried about that right now. So basically, that's how you can get an idea of when you print so that you're not just blindly printing. Okay, so making the print, basically you're going to load and handle the paper properly. So you either use cotton gloves or sometimes the soft brush to brush off any paper um, kind of residue or um, flex. Software drivers will override most of the printer. Uh, physical settings. So if you're getting issues printing, that could be one of the reasons. Use the proper black ink. So basically, you want to make sure that you have, um, like if you're using a printing on matte paper, you want to use a matte black and and photo black if you're using glossy. 1440 DPI versus 2880 DPI in your printer quality settings. It takes twice as long to print, 10 to 15 times or 15 percent more ink, and you're not necessarily always going to get better quality or noticeable quality difference on that. Uh, the media type determines the physical trait, it's not the specific media, and I'll show you what I mean by that. If you're printing black and white, the advanced Epson black and white mode or for your printer is better providing deeper blacks and better print permanence because to do that, better blacks it re reduces the amount of yellow ink that it uses. Printer profiles are basically um, a file that is a table, for example, that um, the printer knows what inks it needs, what levels of inks it needs to adjust to produce the color that you want. So that's basically what a profile is in a nutshell. It's a table of how the colors get um, mapped. Bidirectional versus unidirectional. If you click the high speed setting on your printer, um, it basically prints both directions. There are some issues with that in terms of you might get banding or you might get ink smudging depending on the media and the ink and the printer you're using. So bidirectional is quicker, but you may have issues with quality. Print until the cartridge runs out, just so keep going. If our cartridges are low, the printers these days are so good that you can just easily uh, switch the cartridge mid, mid, um, you know, middle of the print kind of thing. It'll stop, change the ink, and you're good to go. Okay, so let me just quickly go into here, and I'll just. So I'll show you. So let's say that we want to print this image here. Okay, so what I'll do is I'll go to the print module up here. And here's where you have your printer selection and settings. So I have some printer defaults here. And so basically, um, it's just a quick way of printer settings and paper media and stuff like that. So if I go to... Um, select my 11880 Epson and the Fine Art Burrito, for example. You can see that when I bring the page set up here, if it wants to come up, that's fantastic. Looks like it might be having an issue. Looks like Lightroom has crashed on me. That's fantastic. So, I'll come back into that in a second. Let me bring Lightroom back up. Sorry, folks. Okay, got Lightroom back up, got my images. Okay, so I'm going to go to the print module again.
I'm not sure why this is not working now. Not good. Okay, I'm just going to come back to that in a second. Okay, so after the print, we want to make sure there's no flex, blow off dust, things of uh, bits and particles of the paper. You can use a GTI Professional Desktop Viewer booth or an Ot light to hard proof your print. So basically, it's daylight balanced light that um, you can um, calibrate to your monitor so that it's um, you can see what you are, how how realistic and accurate the print is. The cutting and trimming the print, you want to use a good quality paper cutter. Um, because um, you don't want to waste um, good prints because you uh, made that mistake of a cheap cutter. Drying time and outgassing, basically you want to at least about a day, give or take, because gases will come out of the print and you don't want to put those in behind glass right away. Uh, varnishing and coating, well, there's different options to use for that. I use Breathing Color or Hanamule um, coating for varnish and paper, I use uh, sprays. Stretch, mount, frame the canvas. Okay, so I'm going to try and go back into, oh, this one thing here, UV protecting glass and how it work, can work against your print. A lot of people think that protecting glass, uh, prints under UV glass is good. However, it can actually, because the OBA, optical brightening agents, uh, use UV light to, um, you know, activate and bring punch and stuff to your color. If you have glass that stops all the UV light from going through, your print may look a little uh, less have much less impact when it's uh, behind glass. I'm going to try and go back into um, this here, Lightroom, because this is pretty unfortunate that this have decided to crash just now. Okay, so in the printer setup here, I have a printer Epson 11 uh, Pro 11880. And I have right now, for example, set to um, the size of the paper here, and the sheet is source. So I'm not using, for example, this example, I won't use a roll. I'll just use sheet. So when you're into the printer properties then, and I apologize for what the cutoff text here because I'm using a 4K screen. So it's a little bit, um, there's a scaling issue with some of dialog boxes. But when I click on this, you'll see it expand, and you'll see all the options here. So for example, the media type. You'll see options for photo paper, matte paper. So photo paper, for example, you'll see premium glossy, um, semi-gloss, for fine art paper, velvet, watercolor. And these are all Epson printers, uh, paper, sorry. But these do not mean that I have to use Epson papers. These are just specifying things like drying time, the thickness of the paper, and all that kind of stuff. So third-party papers will basically specify when you buy, the buy it, it will specify which of media type to use. So it's not that you have to only buy Epson or Canon or HP um, paper. For the color, we're either printing a color photo or a black and white photo. You can still print black and white photos in the color mode, and but using the advanced black and white mode will give you deeper blacks if you're printing black and white. So for the color mode, we'll leave it there for now. Print quality, so you have a couple options here. So for the quality options, you have the option of selecting, and you can see here, 1440 or 2880. So this is what I was saying earlier about, you know, 1440 is good enough for most things, especially higher quality printers. So you can play around, see if you see the difference with your images. Um, high speed, <coughs> excuse me, this is where that's that unidirectional, bidirectional. So the high speed, you can see the tip show up here, it's bidirectional printing. Um, you don't need to use edge smoothing. It's basically improves the quality of low-resolution images. Finest detail <coughs> is basically it uses tells the printer to use 720 um, DPI resolution mode. Um, by default, it's 360, which is more than adequate. So play around with that. It's going to be diminishing returns depending on um, the image and the media you're using. But so leave those off for now, and it'll be okay. And then basically your mode. So what you want to do for the color management aspect here is you want to make sure that you have it set to custom and off. And if you're using a Mac, you want color sync off. You do not want the printer for the color. You don't want to manage your print for you. You want Lightroom or Photoshop or any other image 
printing program to deal with that for you. So your source here is your paper, or your sheet or roll. And then your size, you can specify sizes here. So basically you have, you know, I have, I can print up to 64 inches wide. This is my printer. So I basically made a bunch of custom paper sizes here. And you do that by going into this dialog box here, user defined paper size. And you basically specify, you know, inches or millimeters. And then you literally just type in the size that you want. And it will populate it on the left here. So then you can choose this going forward. So this is per printer, these um, paper sizes. And here you would see ink um, levels in your printer. This driver um, isn't working so well with Windows 10, so ignore that for now. And then once you have your printer there, you can see this one's on the network, my network here. So basically you here can drag your image size you want, and you can notice the pixels per inch is changing here. So as I was saying before, as long as you have like about 180 or more, you're pretty good. In the cells tab here for module or sorry panel in Lightroom, you can rotate your cell. So that will allow you to change the. Um, so I don't know what's going on here with this. It's kind of getting all finicky with the screen uh, recording. So basically, you can then adjust your image here. And you'll see that it's still at 300 pixels per inch. So you can you can just uh, worry about that and play around with that kind of a thing. But you can also specify your size here if you want. Um, so if I want, say, a 14-inch print, it will automatically keep the aspect ratio for me. You want this usually checked because if I don't have this checked, it will allow me to potentially accidentally change, you know, skew the image, which you don't want to happen. So keep that checked. So then basically now on the page, let's go to the print job here. On the page, the option here is cutting guides. It's basically, it will show you, um, you'll put little marks or lines in the paper so it'll help you as like cutting guides. But the important thing here is the print job. So this is where the color management happens. So you're gonna basically wanna print to printer. Your print sharpening, it's going to be either for matte or for glossy. So this is where the output sharpening happens. And generally, I leave it at standard. You can play around, but standard seems to do a really good job most of the time. Color management, this is where you're going to select your profile, the printer profile. So I've created a bunch of um, custom printer profiles here for my Honey Mule um, materials with the X-Rite i1 Pro Photo 2. Um, sorry, i1 Pro Photo, yeah. So basically that's where you select your um, printer profile and make sure that's correct, otherwise your colors can be quite off. You shouldn't have to use this print adjustment. If you have this on, chances are your color management is a bit of a, a gap somewhere in the, in the workflow. So you wanna make sure that this is uh, off most of the time and then you can make sure you select your printer profile there. So for printer maintenance, print at least a few times a week to help avoid nozzle clogs. If the printers don't print, then you can have issues because they're designed to print. So that's the perform nozzle checks, head cleanings, and head alignments every once in a while when you see performance issues or when you nozzle checks won't clean the heads and you just do head cleaning. You'll eventually at some point clean your wipers, head landing pads. That's where the, the print head lands and stops. You can clean all that kind of stuff with various solutions. Um, you can do some research on that if you get to that point, but just know that there are there is maintenance required to keep things running smoothly. So every once in a while, if you're using uh, the pigment inks, you can remove them and gently shake them um, if you haven't used them in you know a long time because the sediment, the uh, pigment, and the inks will settle to the bottom of the cartridges sometimes. Keep printer drivers and firmware updated. It's all going to help keep your uh, system running smooth and your inks and um, all the, the paper and the profiles working properly. Turn off the printer if it's not being used for a few days at a time. Um, if you're going to print every day or every couple days, just leave the printer on. It does a good job in terms of keeping itself um, unclogged with nozzles. But if you're going to not print for a week or two, just turn it off. Keep the printer covered. 
So get a sheet or something, preferably something that does not create static because you don't want dust to be sucked into, into the printer. A uh, quick couple uh, printer troubleshooting things. I'm running out of timer, so I'm trying to speed this up a little bit. So I want to leave a bit of time in the end for um, some questions. So if your prints are too dark, chances are your monitor is too bright or there's a lighting issue in your environment because if your monitor is too bright, you're compensating for you're going to make the shadows darker and then the print's going to come out darker. So it's really important to make sure that your monitor is calibrated to the proper brightness level. Obvious print color cast. So either typically the problem is that you are your color is being double managed or managed by the printer. So make sure it's Photoshop or Lightroom that's managing the color on your printer. Do not let the ICM, Windows ICM, or the Mac Color Sync, do not let them handle your color management for you. Paper not loading. So you could have dirty rollers. Uh, too humid or too dry your environment. Uh, if you're using a desktop printer, use the rear feeder for like heavier kind of papers. Printer settings keep changing. So basically, if you find that's happening, note that your software, what you set up in Lightroom or Photoshop to print with, those settings are going to override the physical settings that you've put on the printer. So that's why things could get um, interesting if you have your software set to print on roll and your printer set to print on sheets, it's going to tell you that's not properly um, set up for your paper loading. Print drying issues. The environment could be too humid or too dry. It's really important to try and keep your environment between 40 to 60 percent relative humidity. So there's, um, you know, meters and um, that you can uh, buy to keep uh, you up to date with what your current environmental um, situation is there. Paper scratch or ink smeared, so your platen gap could be incorrectly set. Your platen gap is basically how high the head, printer head is on the media. So for thicker media, you want to widen that gap. So I want to quickly, just really quickly go in and show you what I just mentioned about the um, platen gap. So if you go into the paper config, you'll see here, a platen gap setting. So for the thicker paper, you want to use uh, wide or wider, depending. If you use too wide, too high off, then you might lose detail in the print. But you definitely want to be careful that you don't use standard or narrow if um, using thicker papers because you don't want that head to hit that paper because that's a real fast way of uh, creating some pretty costly uh, repair bills. So basically, then there's also the cut method. You can decide if you want the paper to be cut. Um, by default or not. And so just to quickly go over a couple of these, the color density is how much ink gets put on the page. Initially, I wouldn't play with any of these settings. I'm just letting you know that what they are for, um, just for interest sake, dry time per head pass. Basically, when the print goes across, the print head goes across the paper, it'll print a line and then basically it'll wait this amount of time before it goes again so that it gives it more time to, to dry. Print to feed adjustment, paper feed adjustment, basically it is literally how fast the paper gets put through the printer. So depending on certain media and uh, ink combinations, you, at some point you may need to play around with some of these settings. But it's just I wanted to show you um, that it's getting to a bit more technical, advanced stuff, but I um, figured I would show you since I'm already here. All right, well, that's it. Uh, I hope uh, everybody you know, got something out of this. I apologize for the technical difficulties. But um, feel free to contact me at any point, and um, I will be more than happy to, um, you know, help you or guide you in the right direction, any questions you might have. So here's my contact info if you um, are interested in getting a hold of me. And other than that, thank you very much, and it's been a pleasure.